it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Samuel Eidison lecture. Uh, this lecture is held uh, every year in the honor of Samuel Eidison, uh, who was the very first director of the NSIDP, the Neuroscience IDP here at UCLA. Uh, that started in 1972, believe it or not. So, so this year will be the, um, uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, actually in 1993, uh, this lectureship was initiated in the honor of Samuel Eidison and is given to an NSIDP student, to a neuroscience student, uh, who has contributed in some very substantial way to the knowledge uh, of neuroscience, has completed a PhD thesis that's noteworthy to some extent. There is a, there is a committee that decides on these things, and I encourage all of you to encourage your advisors next year and your PhD students to nominate. Uh, it started in 1993, as I said, so this actually marks the 25th Samuel Eidison lecture, something that we failed to notice when, when it came time to really notice the lecture. And the other really special thing is that Samuel Eidison was born in 1918 and passed away in 2007. So it's actually the 10th year uh, anniversary of the right word, the 10th year of uh, Years since since he passed away, memorials or memorial uh, in his name. Uh, Samuel Eidison, for those of you who are interested in, in those things, when you look him up on Google, he worked in neuropsychopharmacology. I don't really know what that is either, but he wrote a textbook that's called Biochemistry and Behavior. And that sort of illustrates it much better to me than he really worked on one of the things uh, with an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. So it's my pleasure this year uh, to welcome as the speaker Supraya uh, Varadarajan and um, did some absolutely extraordinary work. So I told you that Samuel Eidison wrote the textbook and one of the, one of the amazing things about Supraya's work is she's not writing a textbook but she's rewriting textbooks. So we just heard from some people here at UCLA that are giving lectures and student talks that they are sort of a little annoyed at this work because it makes them have to change their own lectures now and we think that actually textbooks will have to be rewritten to some extent too. So it's a pleasure to uh, hand this back. And I give the microphone over to uh, Supraya's uh, PI who will tell us a little bit more about this amazing work and the amazing person who won. All right. So it's really a pleasure to introduce Soup today. She was an undergraduate at, <laughs> I'm going to try this, Vishvesvareya Technological University and came to the U.S. to do her master's at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Sorry that I can say that so fluently. And then she spent a couple of years in Eileen Anderson's lab at UCI as a technician before starting in graduate school. So this is a, a somewhat circuitous route, but I think it already shows that key element of persistence that is critical to a successful graduate career. And I'm still in this denial about this, and we'll start weeping at the thought of it, but she's continuing uh, this upward trajectory, leaving my lab this month, uh, moving to Andy Huberman's lab at Stanford University for her postdoctoral work. So Soup joined my lab in 2010, and she rapidly contributed to an ongoing project in a lab that got her second authorship and development. And she could have stayed on this project for her thesis. Might have been a smart move temporarily, I have to say, but I came to her with, a, with an exciting proposition. Uh, would she take on a project, a project that had already failed in the lab, because I needed her to complete a characterization for an R01 grant that I needed to show progress on. It would be a quick paper, I told her, which no one should ever believe from my lab. <laughs> anyway, remarkably, and um, despite Soup having seen um, the increasingly tense lab meetings where it was, became clear just how badly this project was failing, Soup said yes. And I have to give us both credit here, to be, to be fair, um, although I was perhaps more motivated by desperation. Um, 
that even at that point, neither of us were daunted by the lack of projects on the project. We both saw the biological incongruity that was at the heart of this project that we wanted to explain. We both had the insight that there was something that needed to be explained. So I say all this because when Soup um, lays out the story in her talk, it will unfold as if it was obvious, but it was not. And there were many blind alleys that we followed before we finally understood the mechanism by which Netrin um, functions in the spinal cord. And because I did the control with Soup, I know that those moments of blazing understanding, they, though they were so exciting and they'll stay with me my whole career, they're specifically because it was Soup that was at the helm of this project. I also would like to give a shout out for, to the environment that we found ourselves in at UCLA, that we had many colleagues that we could discuss this work, Alvaro, Larry, Elsie, and of course, Ben. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the BRI and the Neuroscience Graduate Program for recognizing this work with this honor. So I'm actually gonna let Soup tell her own scientific story. It'll be published in Neuron tomorrow. I just wanted to again reiterate some of the feedback that I've received. So the most common uh, is what Felix has already alluded to, a complaint <laughs> that people have to rewrite their lectures. As the, student, the first year students know, I also had to do that, which was a little strange. But I'm gonna let somebody else um, actually, I'm gonna quote somebody else in summarizing this work. This is Jeffrey Goodhill, who recently um, reviewed our paper in Faculty of a Thousand. So he writes, Netrin one was the textbook example of chemotropic guidance and was one of the very few examples of putative guidance factors ever observed in a gradient in vivo. These new results suggest a shift in thinking about axon guidance more broadly and may prove to be a major turning point in the field. Sue. I'm very excited to be talking about my thesis work here today. Um, I'll be talking to you about the role of Netra 1 as an axon guidance cue in the developing spinal cord and how we are reinterpreting its function. So I'll start off with a brief overview of the different stages of neural development so I can focus on the phase that my project is focused on. So right from induction, we have neural precursor cells that get patterned to form one of several different progenitor subtypes that then differentiate and give rise to mature neurons. And these mature neurons then put out axons that are guided to form a functional neural circuit. And my project entirely focuses on this phase, which is axon guidance. So you can see each of these events really nicely in the developing spinal cord. So if you, take, if you look at this cartoon of a mouse embryo and take a transverse section of the spinal cord, you get the dorsal end with the roof plate up here and the ventral end with the floor plate down here. And in the early stages, the progenitor, there are proliferating progenitors that are packed in the ventricular zone within these dotted lines. And they have apical and basal attachments and they keep dividing on that horizontal axis. And once um, patterning signals such as BMPs and sonic hedgehogs come in, these progenitors are patterned to assume one of several different progenitor subtype identities. These uh, progenitors then differentiate, they lose these attachments, and they move out from the ventricular zone as mature neurons into this mantle zone. And there are about 11 different uh, neuronal subtypes. And each of these neurons then give rise to axons that are guided to form functional circuits. And in these early stages, there are three broad directions in which axons grow. You have commissural axons, which come from interneurons that largely grow circumferentially around the ventricular zone. They reach the floor plate, cross that, and then extend longitudinally. You have motor neurons that extend axons outside the spinal cord. And you have sensory neurons that extend central branches into the spinal cord. But regardless of which uh, neuronal subtype these axons come from or what their trajectories are, they still have to, uh, they all have to travel very precise pathways and connect with very precise synaptic partners in order to form a functional uh, nervous system. And it's the precision with which they travel and connect that decides our functional abilities to perform day-to-day -day functions such as respiration, cognition, speech, movement, etc. So how do these axons know to navigate correctly? They interact with several molecular cues in their embryonic environment. But really, axon guidance dates as far back as Cajal's chemotropic hypothesis. So in this diagram here, Cajal suggested that um, growth cones, which are at the leading edge of these axons, grow towards an attractive source that's emanating from the axon's target. And so you can see that over here, these commissural axons with beautiful growth cones are growing towards the floor plate and they're crossing and moving. 
And many decades later, it was suggested that these growth hormones actually first interact with uh, one or several intermediate targets, called guidepost cells shown here. And they interact with these, and that shapes their trajectory before they reach their final synaptic partner. And so this, and this was done in the grasshopper limb, but the presence of such intermediate targets was also shown using Tahal's model system, the embryonic spinal cord, and so where they took a piece of this dorsal, um, is it still working? A piece of the dorsal spinal cord and a piece of the floor plate, and you can see that over here. So here's your dorsal spinal cord, here's the floor plate, and they notice profuse outgrowth of axons from the dorsal spinal cord growing towards the floor plate. So it suggested that the floor plate was also providing attractive cues and acting as an uh, intermediate target in the invertebrates. And this cue was later purified and identified as chick netrin 1 and chick netrin 2. So netrins were really the first cue, first molecular evidence that supported Cajal's chemotropism. And they tested those cues in similar in vitro assay where they took a dorsal spinal cord and exposed it to a cluster of cost cells. And these cost cells can be transfected to expect, uh, express the vector of your choice. So if they uh, transfected it with a control vector, then they didn't notice any strange behavior. But when the cost cells were transfected to secrete netrin 1, they noticed this profuse outgrowth similar to when they were seeing the floor plate. And so that suggested that this attractive cue is netrin 1. They also saw a similar outgrowth with netrin 2, but it wasn't as potent. And when they looked at the mRNA expression of chick netrin 1 in vivo in uh, chick embryonic spinal cords, they noticed this nice restriction of netrin 1 only at the floor plate. So that really reinforced the idea that netrin was acting as this chemoattractant and diffusing to act over a long range. And it was all acting as an intermediate target. So next, when they went on to look in mouse embryos, here you can see commissural axons labeled in red. And these axons, uh, they start out from the dorsal spinal cord and they grow, uh, they grow circumferentially around the ventricular zone towards the floor plate. But in netrin mutants, these axons were now stalled. Very few reached the floor plate, and most of them were stalled above the motor column. So it suggested that in the absence of netrin, these axons weren't able to grow and reach that floor plate. And so that really gave rise to this textbook canonical model that netrin 1 was present as a schemotractant in the floor plate and was acting over a long range to attract those dorsal commissural axons. And um, after that, many, uh, many such cues were identified, and we have this nice compact model of how these guidance cues act together. So uh, very quickly, guidance cues can be classified as long-range cues or short-range cues, and these can either be repulsive or attractive. And long-range cues are thought to be more secreted and diffusible, so they can diffuse from a point source and act over a long range, whereas short-range cues are more contact-dependent or membrane-bound and act within a one to two cell diameter. And so you can see here that this neuron receives these chemorepulsive cues, which are long range. They extend their axons away from it. They then grow through this contact-dependent region where they're hemmed through, and they extend their growth cone towards this chemoattractive source. So it's really a combination of these push and pull forces that helps the axon navigate precisely with minimum errors. And you can see a very nice example of this in the transverse section. So if you look at these commissural neurons, they have their cell bodies in the dorsal spinal cord. They receive repulsive cues, which are the BMPs from the roof plate, and extend axons away from it. They then grow circumferentially towards this chemoattractive source of uh, cues coming from the floor plate, namely sonic hedgehog and netrin 1. And if you look at an image of such a transverse section, you immediately notice two distinct regions. You have this progenitor-rich ventricular zone in blue, and you also have the region just outside of that where the axons grow. So whether you look at a single class of axons, such as the tag one, commissural axons in red, so we're talking about a single trajectory, or if you look at all axons with neurofilament, so we're talking about multiple different trajectories, they all grow around the ventricular zone without innervating it. And you can see that inverse relationship here more clearly. Where there are progenitors in the ventricular zone, these axons don't grow, but instead they grow just adjacent to it without innervating it. And while these polarizing cues are sufficient to provide information on what to grow away from and what to grow towards, they don't specify information on how to grow around the ventricular zone without innervating it. So the most obvious explanation is there must be some other cue present in the ventricular zone that prevents these axons from entering that region. And so we went back to Netrin to uh, assess Netrin as a possible candidate. 
But uh, if you look at natron one mRNA expression of natron one in chick spinal cords, as I've shown you, it's very clearly restricted only to the floor plate. Um, whereas natrin 2 is in the rest of the ventricular zone, which is not as potent. But if you look at mouse natrin 1, you can see that mouse natrin 1 is very strongly expressed in the floor plate, but it is also extending into the ventricular zone up to around here in the dorsal spinal cord. And there is no natrin 2 in the mice, so natrin 1 is really taking up this composite function of natrin 1 and 2 from chick. And so it's much harder to make the same argument that natrin is acting as a long-range chemoattractant from the floor plate because it is really present all along the trajectory of these axons. So that's really where my project picked up, and we wondered what the role of natrin-1 might be in the ventricular zone. Was it doing anything at all? Was it providing the same sort of cues? Uh, was it acting differently from the floor plate? Or was it, in fact, specifying that boundary to keep the axons from innervating that spinal cord? And so I went about answering this in three different, uh, with three different questions. One was uh, we first wanted to assess the spatial correlation between natron expression and axon growth. Then we wanted to assess the behavior of these axons in the absence of natron 1. And finally, we wanted to understand the mechanism by which natron 1 might specify such a boundary. So the first bit, we, um, everything I'm going to be showing you uh, forward is all mouse embryonic spinal cords. So at day 10 and a half in mouse embryos, which is when the uh, first pioneering axons are starting to grow and find their way in the spinal cord, you can see here that natron expression is really strong in the floor plate, and it's starting to extend into the ventricular zone. You can see the same pattern with beta-gal, because when we use the natrin lac -C reporter mouse, the byproduct, which is beta-gal, serves as a nice proxy for the cells that are producing natrin. And it turns to be a much more uh, sensitive readout, so it's extending well into the dorsal ventricular zone. And if you look at neurofilament, what really stood out was that the point at which these green neurofilament axons start to grow coincided very well with that dorsal boundary of natrin. And so we wondered if that dorsal ventricular zone natrin was providing some initiation factor for these axons to start growing. Then when we looked a day later at 11 and a half, when most commensural axons have reached the floor plate, uh, I've already shown you this, natrin extends well into the ventricular zone up till that dorsal boundary. And you can see the same pattern with beta-gal. But when we looked at the protein, this was really surprising to us. You can still see a low level of expression in the floor plate and the ventricular zone, but what stood out now was this high intensity of natrin all along the peel surface in the basement membrane and natrin in what looked like commissural axons. And interestingly, this has been shown before, but the function of natrin in those axons or the presence of natrin on the peel surface was not addressed, so we wanted to delve into that in a little more detail. And for this, we used Nestin. So just to remind you, these proliferating progenitors, these neural progenitors that are making natrin, have apical and basal attachments, and uh, these radial glial processes can be marked with nestin. So when we looked at high magnification, we noticed that there was a lot of natrin present along these nestin fibers in the ventricular zone, as well as where the nestin end feet contact that peel surface. So it's getting deposited. So what we think is happening is that natrin is being produced in these regions and is then transported out along these nestin fibers to get deposited in that peel surface. So we wanted to check the specificity of the peel staining, and we used laminin for this. And I'll draw your attention to two distinct regions. In this first region, just adjacent to the roof plate, which is above this dorsal boundary of natrin, you can see laminin marking the basement membrane, but there is no natrin. Whereas when you look at this intermediate region, you can see that natrin and laminin co-localize really nicely in that region. So it tells us that natrin, the spiel staining is specific and that it aligns really well with the regions where natrin is produced in that ventricular zone. And it's also making an argument against any diffusion in vivo. So I'll show you a quick video, hopefully it works, but uh, essentially uh, we have three different proteins here. We have nestin in green, red is all natrin, and blue is laminin. So what I've done is uh, rendered these three proteins and then I've isolated all the natrin um, uh, spots that are within one micron of the nestin filaments, and then I'll do the same with laminin. So here are the rendering, and in red you can see all the natrin, and now I've isolated only the natrin that's very close to the nestin. And you can see there's a lot of nestin that's along these nestin, a um, lot of natrin that's along these nestin fibers, and so it tells us that it is moving along these nestin filaments. <laughs> 
And this is again all the netrin, and now I'll isolate the netrin that's only on the laminin surface or in the laminin surface, and you can see that a lot of netrin gets deposited specifically within that laminin surface. So then when we looked at neurofilament and beta-gal expression at 11 and a half, again here you can see that the a point at which these axons start to grow coincides with that dorsal boundary. They then grow just adjacent to this ventricular zone where natrin is being produced in these low regions of natrin, and they grow adjacent to the ventricular zone without innervating it. And similarly, they grow underneath the floor plate just uh, in the commissure, which is actually free of any natrin expression. And you can see the same pattern with the antibody, that these axons grow just adjacent to that PL surface and underneath the floor plate cells. So they're really growing uh, around those natrin expressing domains without innervating those regions. And you can see the same um, behavior being reinforced at 12 and a half. And 12 and a half becomes more interesting. Most of these commissural axons have crossed, and you have this transient upregulation of natrin, which has been shown to uh, act as a repulsive cue to keep uh, sensory axons from prematurely innervating the spinal cord. Um, so when you look at uh, neurofilament expression, you can see beta-gal over here, which shows that netrin is being up, uh, upregulated by these cells, and these axons are curving just around that, which becomes more clear in more cervical sections. You have a transient domain of netrin expression, and these axons are really curving to grow around it. So their trajectories seem to be shaped by these netrin expressing domains. So to summarize this first bit, I've shown you that right from axogenesis, netrin is being produced in the ventricular zone by these neural progenitors. It's then transported out along the nest and fibers to get deposited on the PL surface. And all along, these axons are growing between two boundaries of netrin, netrin on the PL surface and these netrin expressing domains, and their trajectories seem to be shaped by these uh, netrin expressing domains. And so then we wanted to assess that idea by removing netrin and seeing what happens to these axon trajectories. So for this, we went back to the netrin LACC reporter mice. And at E10 and a half, when the pioneering axons are starting to grow, you can see that this is where netrin is expressed. And these axons start to grow at that dorsal boundary of netrin. But in our mutants, this is now completely uh, disrupted. It's not so much that these axons don't initiate, but they, are more, they lose their orientation and project more dorsally towards the floor plate, uh, towards the roof plate, which is absent in controls. And so we think that the dorsal boundary of netrin helps eventually orient these axons and maintain their trajectories. And at E11 and a half, I'll show you three different markers. So first is neurofilament in red, which marks all axons. And robo 3 marks commissural axons. And tag 1 marks commissural as well as sensory axons. And here, if you look at neurofilament, again, in controls, you know, the drill, they start at that dorsal boundary of netrin. They grow around the ventricular zone without innervating it. And that's completely disrupted in our mutants. So a lot of axons now lose their ventral orientation and project dorsally towards the roof plate. Many of them are now able to invade that ventricular zone boundary and project medially. And if you look at commissural axons, commissural axons also innervate those uh, ventricular zone regions. And these tightly fasciculated bundles that are projecting towards the roof, uh, towards the floor plate, are now completely defasciculated. And with tag one, you can see the classically described phenotype, whereby most axons tall above the motor column and very few reach the floor plate. So we quantified this phenotype by dividing the spinal cord into four roughly equal regions that we call zones one through four, and we counted just all the neurofilament axons that innervate, these, uh, innervate the ventricular zone. And you can see that in our mutants, in all four regions from dorsal to ventral, we see a significant increase in the number of axons that are now able to grow into the ventricular zone. So at E12 and a half, you can see the same uh, phenotype where you have these transient upregulations of netrin, and if you look at the trajectory of these axons and controls, they're curving around that boundary, whereas in mutants, a lot, of, lot more of them are able to innervate those netrin-expressing domains. And so really, when netrin is present, it helps orient these axons ventrally, and it maintains the trajectory and prevents these axons from entering the ventricular zone, and they're completely defasciculated in the absence of netrin. So this is good, but it still didn't tell us what the contribution of ventricular zone netrin was. So we, we wanted to understand whether the floor plate netrin was acting as a schemoattractant, whereas the ventricular zone netrin was either doing the same thing or it wasn't doing, or the axons are completely unresponsive to it, or was it specifying a boundary and doing something else different. 
So um, we did four different manipulations to understand that question. And uh, in the first, we did an anatomical ablation of the floor plate using GLE2 mutants. Next, we uh, conditionally removed natron expression only from the floor plate cells. And then we did a similar approach to the ventricular zone where we conditionally removed natron expression from the dorsal ventricular zone. And uh, in, in the fourth manipulation, we did a focal uh, disruption of natron from the ventricular zone. So in the first um, manipulation, we use the GLE2 mutants, and in the GLE2 mutants, the floor plate cells are ablated, and so with that, any ventrally polarizing force, such as the highest concentrations of netrin, as well as sonic hedgehog, are absent. And as a result, you have an anatomical defect where these motor columns fuse together. But if you look at the mRNA expression of netrin in controls, it's really present very strongly in the floor plate as well as in the ventricular zone. Whereas in our GLE2 mutants, when the floor plate cells are absent, that highest concentrations of netrin are absent. But the netrin in the ventricular zone is still intact. Whereas in GLE2 netrin double mutants, netrin is absent in both regions. And so if you look at behavior of axons with neurofilament, you can see that in controls, these axons start at that dorsal boundary. They then grow around the ventricular zone without innervating it. And in GLE2 mutants, even though the floor plate netrin is absent, these axons are continuing that behavior and obeying that boundary. So it tells us that the ventricular zone netrin is sufficient to specify that boundary. And when we looked at uh, netrin GLE2 double mutants, we now see that these axons lose their ventral orientation and project dorsally. Many of them project medially into the ventricular zone. And so it's only when we remove the ventricular zone netrin as well are these axons able to innervate that boundary. And so again, ventricular zone netrin is the one that is required to specify that boundary and keep the axons from innervating that region. Uh, so then next, we wanted to assess the same thing with a much cleaner genetic manipulation. And for this, we use a sonic hedgehog Cree driver. And here you can see that sonic hedgehog is expressed very nicely only by these floor plate cells. So when we cross these mice with a netron flocks line, we can remove the, uh, any netron expression from these floor plate cells which you can see here with the antibody in controls, you can see netrin protein accumulating on the peel surface as well as axons and in the floor plate. But in our mutants, while the peel and the axonal staining is still intact, netrin, is pro netrin protein is absent from the floor plate. And so one might predict that remove, if netrin was acting as a chemoattractant, then removing any netrin from the floor plate should have devastating guidance defects. So here is a control. Again, you know this drill. They start at that dorsal boundary. They grow around the ventricular zone. And we pretty much notice the same behavior in our mutants. So they're still able to obey that ventricular zone boundary. And it's the same thing with the commissural axons. They grow largely normally and obey that ventricular zone boundary with only minor defysiculation defects near the floor plate. And so it tells us that even in the absence of the floor plate, these axons are able to reach and grow and reach towards the ventral midline and cross it. And so it's the ventricular zone netrin that's required to specify that boundary. Uh, and as a result, we don't see any significant difference in the number of axons that innervate the ventricular zone. And so now we wanted to assess that hypothesis by doing similar manipulations in the ventricular zone. So for this, we use the PAX3 Cree driver. And PAX3 Cree is expressed in these dorsal neural progenitors. And so when we cross them with our netrin floxed mice, all these progenitors that express netrin will no longer express netrin. And so we're removing any netrin expression from this dorsal ventricular zone. And if you look at the antibody, here is our control. You can see that netrin is accumulating in the peel surface and in these axons. But when you look at our mutants, there is no peel accumulation or there is no, there is no netrin accumulation in the axons as well. But in the intermediate and more ventral spinal cord where netrin is still being expressed by those neural progenitors, netrin is starting to accumulate on the spiel surface and in the axons. And so when we looked at neurofilament, we noticed that compared to our controls, in the regions where we've removed netrin expression, these axons lose that ventral orientation and they project dorsally. And they also project medially into the ventricular zone. So here's the dorsal boundary of netrin. In control, they start at that boundary. But in these regions where we've removed netrin expression, they lose that orienting force and project dorsally. And they're able to grow into the, ventral, uh, into the ventricular zone. Whereas in the intermediate and ventral spinal cords where netrin is still intact, they are, the ventral netrin seems sufficient to at least partially rescue those guidance trajectories. And with the commissural axons, again, they are by and large normal with only guidance defects in the regions where we remove netrin, whereas ventrally, uh, we only see minor defysiculation defects. 
And so you can see that here in the quantification, it's only in the regions where we remove netrin do we see a significant increase in the number of axons innervating the ventricular zone. So it really tells us that netrin is acting locally in specifying uh, a boundary at short range to keep those axons from entering that region. And um, we then wanted to perform a more focal deletion, and for this we took advantage of some beautiful work that was done in Ben Novich's lab. Um, so to put it very simply, we used a DBX1 Cree driver and knocked down notch signaling. And so the work that, so the effect that it has is that any progenitors in this DBX domain rapidly differentiate and evacuate that region. You can see that over here, so DBX1 domain is marked by this GFP, SOX2 is marking those progenitors in the ventricular zone which are completely intact in our controls. Here is your netrin expression and your filament axons are growing around the ventricular zone. Whereas in our mutants, these uh, progenitors rapidly differentiate and they evacuate the ventricular zone, creating a gap in the SOX2 staining. And fortunately for us, we also noticed a corresponding gap in the netrin expression, thus now creating two ectopic domains of netrin. And so when we looked at neurofilament expression, we noticed that these axons preferentially grew into that region devoid of netrin. You can see that here better. Um, when we remove any progenitors that are expressing netrin, these axons preferentially grew into that region. And, in, and you can see the significant increase over here. Whereas in regions outside of the DBX domain where netrin is still intact, we don't see any significant increase. We also assess the behavior of these axons and notice that more axons preferentially grow along these boundaries of netrin rather than straight into that gap. So it again suggests that it's the ventricular zone netrin that's acting locally to specify that boundary. And not only are these axons being prevented from entering those regions, but they also preferentially like to grow along these boundaries of netrin, suggesting that netrin is acting as an adhesive substrate in those contexts. And I should add that recently there was another paper, uh, floor plate derived netrin one is dispensable for commercial axon guidance. And so there's, this was really beautiful work that reiterates the same thing where they've removed floor plate netrin, they don't see any guidance defects, but when they removed ventricular zone netrin, they see severe guidance defects. And that really supports our model very nicely and they show this in the hindbrain. And this came out just a few weeks ago in Nature. Um, so then for the third bit, we wanted to understand how netrin might specify such a boundary. And for this, we looked at the expression of netrin receptors. So there are two classes of netrin receptors, DCC, which mediates attraction, and the unc family, unc A, B, C, and D, that mediates repulsion. And so we looked at the uh, expression of these netrin receptors in 11 and a half spinal cords. And here you can see that unc A is expressed by these motor columns. UNC5B is only expressed in blood vessels at these stages. UNC5C is expressed in the motor columns as well as in the DRGs, whereas UNC5D is not really expressed in these early stages. And if you look at DCC, DCC is expressed very strongly in commissural axons, and the protein is also very strong in, strongly in the commissural axons as well as likely in the motor columns. And what's interesting is that if you look at these DCC positive axons, they also grow just adjacent to that ventricular zone without innervating it. So because we think that there is a repulsive component to this boundary where these axons are being prevented from entering the ventricular zone, we started looking at the UNC5 mutants. And so here is our control. And when you look at UNC5A mutants, so just to remind you, their UNC5A is expressed in these regions in the motor columns. We noticed that uh, axons start innovating only that region in the ventricular zone, which is zone four, whereas the commercial axons grow largely normally. Whereas now when you look at UNC5C, again UNC5C is expressed in the motor columns and in the DRGs, and those are the regions where we see uh, innovation of um, axons entering the ventricular zone. And these are suspected to be sensory axons prematurely entering because UNC5C is expressed in those DRGs. But we next looked at DCC, and to our surprise, we saw a much more severe phenotype. So here in controls, they start at that dorsal boundary, they project around the ventricular zone, Whereas in DCC mutants, these axons lose their orientation and project dorsally towards the roof plate, and many axons are now able to innervate the ventricular zone and grow medially. And if you look at commercial axons, commercial axons also project medially into the ventricular zone, and they're severely deficiculated compared to our controls. And the tag one phenotype has been shown before where most axons stall above the motor column. 
And so if you look at the quantification, you can see that in the young five mutants, the, we see a significant increase in the regions where the receptors are expressed, whereas in DCC, it's a much more severe phenotype that phenocopies the netrin mutants really well. So it suggests two important things. One is that many classes of axons are affected by this loss of netrin DCC signaling from dorsal to ventral. And two, that DCC is a key receptor that's mediating the ventricular zone boundary specified by netrin. And uh, it, that's really surprising because if you look at the DCC uh, antibody, these axons, these commissural axons, express a lot of DCC. So they're equipped with the attractive receptor towards netrin, and yet they grow around the ventricular zone without innervating those netrin-expressing regions. And it's only when you remove either netrin or DCC to, are they able to innervate that region, suggesting that when netrin and DCC are present, these axons are prevented from entering the ventricular zone. So we wondered how netrin and DCC might be interacting if it wasn't a simple ligand receptor attraction. And for this, I'll go back to the third component of the netrin protein expression. So we've spoken about netrin protein in the ventricular zone as well as in the peel surface, but I'll draw your attention to netrin accumulation on these commercial axons. As you can see here, it's starting to accumulate on those commercial axons. And we know that this is specific because when you look at our netrin mutants, the peel staining as well as the axonal accumulation of netrin is lost. And what remains are these speckles because the antibody recognizes the netrin beta-gal fusion protein. And so when we looked at our DCC mutants, you can see that the peel staining is still intact, but this axonal accumulation of netrin is now completely severely diminished. And so it suggests that netrin is accumulating on axons in a DCC-dependent manner, perhaps to promote fasciculation. And a recent study done in the Zabersky lab showed that frazzled, which is the receptor for uh, netrin receptor in Drosophila, also as the frazzled and netrin act as a more adhesive interaction rather than uh, chemo attraction. And so that supports our model too really nicely where we think that netrin is providing this adhesive substrate and that netrin and DCC are acting more in an adhesive interaction rather than long range chemo attraction. So to conclude, in the canonical model, we've always seen that netrin is present uh, as a chemo attractant in the floor plate, and it acts over a long range to kind of guide those dorsal commissural axons. But really what I'm showing you here today is that netrin is produced by those neural progenitors in the ventricular zone. It's then transported out to get deposited on the peel surface and as well as on commis in commissural axons in a DCC-dependent manner. And when we remove any component of netrin or DCC, these axons are now able to innervate those boundaries and lose the ventral orientation and are completely defasciculated. So all along, these axons are growing between two boundaries of netrin, the peel netrin, as well as these netrin-expressing domains, and are being prevented from entering these regions, but they also like to grow on those substrates of netrin. And because we don't think this is a simple, it's a simple attraction or repulsion, but it's really a combination of the two, we're comparing it to the way an ivy plant would grow on a wall. So the plant likes to adhere onto the wall for support, but it's prevented from penetrating it. And that's really the behavior of the axons that we're seeing here. These axons like to grow on those adhesive netrin substrates, but are being prevented from entering those netrin expressing regions. So with that, I'd like to thank Samantha especially for being such a fantastic mentor and giving me a chance to work on this project, Ben for really so many wonderful discussions and suggestions, and the rest of my thesis committee have all been really supportive and encouraged me over the last few years. Um, everyone in the Butler Lab, especially Keith, for teaching me so many techniques, and a big shout out to Eliana, Caitlin, and Sandy who are gonna be working on this project going forward. Everyone in the Novich Lab and Kanye Lab who's helped me with so many techniques and questions, and our funding sources, and thank you all for coming. Right, so as far as the boundary goes or how they avoid that region, so they're growing in between that peel surface and the ventricular zone, and we don't know why they choose to separate right at that point. One could just be a simple explanation could be that the motor column is expanding and there's, they, it's growing larger, and so there's some cue coming from the motor column that helps them grow away. 
like a repulsive cue or something. Um, the other reason could be that they're just following the ventricular zone boundary and so they're really sticking onto that boundary and growing uh, towards the midline. But we don't know exactly why they separate from that point, which is actually very interesting, but we don't know the answer yet. Yeah. What percentage of the axons are innervating the ventricular in the absence of metric? So you showed some really nice examples, but it's impossible for me to say, you know, is this 2% of the axons and that already might look impressive, or is it half, or is it, it's certainly not all of them. I think it's a four-fold increase um, compared to our controls. Um, but if you compare it to the axons that still travel there. So, what, so the, when you say it's a fourfold increase from half a percent to two percent, would be a fourfold increase. So it's still a huge minority of the axons that take the upper It's it's a huge majority of the axons that actually innervate the ventricular zone. So I think in control in controls also we do see some axons right. that innervate. It's about ten to fifteen, whereas in mutants that I think that increases to like fifty five or something. Just a number, so it's a it's a majority of the axons that actually innervate, and about fifty of those fifty percent of those are commissural axons. Yeah. Uh, do you see any, or do you see any evidence for a role of metron after it's turned? Uh, it's so it is present along that peel surface, and it's in those axons. So we wonder whether, I mean, because those, I mean, the commercial axons are projecting longitudinally, right? So we wonder whether it still helps them adhere on to those longitudinal tracks and it just continues. Um, or it keeps them fasciculated because it's also accumulating on those axons. So it's possible, but we don't know. But you haven't seen anything in the mutants? No, no, we haven't done any open book or preps or to assess that longitudinal trajectories. It's hard in mouse. It's going to be easier to check. We have to go back to check, but then you have the Netchin 1, Netchin 2 additional confusion or additional. That might also be helpful. But if there is anything, it would be along those longitudinal tracks. So in the third picture up there, you have <coughs> Netchin in red, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And those dots. So you yeah. talked about the progenitor cells accumulating it on the edge, but in those pictures, you showed it all the way through. So that, uh, the progenitors are making it, and then it's traveling along the... Um, on the outside? Sorry? On it, the exterior part of the progenitors? So, the, uh, so here, the net netrin's in red, and the green is the nestin filaments mm -hmm. that's coming from those progenitors, and so they're moving along those nestin filaments outside of the ventricular zone. Yeah. But I think, I'm not sure what... But is the confusion in the model that it's red and green, or...? No, I think the confusion was I was expecting it all to be out lateral, and, and when you showed the movie, you saw it all the way through. Yeah, so there's a lot being made okay. continuously from 10 through 12, and so it's still being expressed in the ventricular zone, and it's also being moved out. So we see it in all those regions, and then it gets deposited. But that's a really, if I may just, that's a really, it's, I don't know if it's a confounding point or just a point of interest in that, the behavior of the model, the axons is really clear. They grow around in the cells that are making netrin and adjacent to the peel boundary. But when you start looking at netrin antibody, is it messy? Is it is that the problem? It's it becomes more confounding. Yeah, <laughs> confounding, <laughs> right? But the behavior of the axons is very clear. Yeah. But to follow up on that question, the image that you're showing here it looks as if the netrin is going with the axons themselves. So is this... This is nestin. Oh. The green is nestin. Oh, okay, so this is not, a, this is not an axon. One. No, it's so actually, uh, I think that is the peel surface. Not the oh, so you've rotated the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How long does the netrin stay there for? How long does the netrin what? Oh, I don't know. I think, I think it's also expressed at 13. I know for sure that those transient boundaries go away at 13, but I think I'm, I haven't looked any later than 12. Mm 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I've I've wondered too because if this is if this is all is its function, then most of this commercial axons are growing away. It shouldn't be needed any longer, but we haven't looked any later yet. Yeah. If the nitrogen is still there, why and so the axons grow down, why don't they grow back? So so is there still a long range attractive to you then that's nitrogen free? That they where they don't grow back, you mean yes. on the other side? No, or? just so so they travel in their tunnel. Mm -hmm. So what prevents them from making a one eighty? So so is there still a long range attractive cue that they are sensing sensing even in the tunnel? I don't think there is any long range cue left in there. There's still some sonic hedgehog. Um, yeah. So there's still some sonic hedgehog which could be providing some uh, long range attraction, but other than that, at the ventral midline, once they cross, there's also slit and robo. And so that prevents them from crossing back. So that's a, the, so the slit is acting as a repulsive cue and these axons which express robo are prevented from entering back into the midline. If, if there are no further questions, let's thank Soup again for an amazing talk.